girls had to wear skirts and dresses. And uh, actually, when I started teaching, back when my second student teaching, it was about in the late 1960s, I called Gloria Lay to see she knew, when they actually let teachers wear pants to school. Do you remember my name? It was after 70. Was it after 70? Yeah, after, after you got it. Oh, Gene. It was a revolution. <laughs> yeah. And I actually got into teaching when I came home from college. I finished it in December of 1951. Mr. Gill knew everything. And he really did. He was a, he was an institution in himself. It was it was great. Going to school with him and teaching. He called me in, and he wanted to know if I would start teaching. I didn't know what I was going to do when I got home at Christmas. And he asked me, would I take Helen Bledsoe's place? Now, she was the coach's wife in uh, the eighth grade. I thought, all eighth grade that last semester, because she was pregnant. And if you couldn't even teach if you were a little bit pregnant, why? <coughs> And anyway, so I, that's when I started. I talked two and a half years and quit. And then, uh, back to Mr. Gill. How many of you remember him? <laughs> he, his uh, office was in the high school building. Actually, he was right there. In that. And we always said he knew every board in that building. Where they, that's where Junior High used to stay. Because he never made the boards creak when he came to the study hall. <laughs> and, uh, I, I likened him to Teddy Roosevelt. He, uh, he walked softly, but he carried a big stick. And, That's but, true. <laughs> but you had a lot of respect for him, and I still, uh, I, he, he deserved a lot of respect. He was a great administrator. Anyway, I came back after having been out about 10 years, and uh, when they needed um, a remedial math teacher because we went into Title IX and school would get all of those wonderful electronic devices, overhead projectors, all those things that are defunct now that, that they don't need anymore, they don't use anymore, but, but they wanted them and that's when I came back into teaching. And, uh, um, Oh, back to my high school days. Maybe I need to tell you this, too, about how things have changed. Because um, back then you couldn't dance. We didn't have dances. We had junior and senior dances. No dancing, no proms. No, that's big uh, And uh, what, when did PTA go out, Gene? I've been trying to think. We had, yeah, it's after. No, it's after. Yeah, so that's a change from, from when I was not teaching and having children. So we did have a PTA because I remember doing hearing tests for at elementary school when JFK was assassinated. So. But, uh, and the White House has changed. We used to call the administrative office the White House. You were there, weren't you, Ben? Yeah. And that was where... And I talked to Gloria and she said, you know, all those things, electric typewriters, overhead projectors, none of that is, is anymore. I'm going to give my piece over to you in a minute. And I, I do want to say one thing. When we had total integration, we had um, freedom of choice about 60. 68, 68, 60, 60, somewhere in there, because 67. Holly said that that's when she came, became acquainted with Jerome Harris, who's a great guy, and he came under freedom of choice. And then, uh, Seth, Gene says about 70, when we had total integration. And I will say that I think Dumas did it more smoothly, and that was under the auspices of Harold Tidwell. And I give a lot of credit to him and, and to our administration, to our faculty. And I, I think we everything just ran smoothly and it was long overdue. But I, I was so proud of everybody involved, students, teachers, and administrators. I think we did a super job. And I was
part. I'm glad to be part of it. Which one? I don't forget about it. Okay. <laughs> you probably hear me without. Can you hear me without this? No. Huh? No. That's what I. Well, thought. you just did. We uh, <laughs> well, I, I was born uh, right over here on East Bank Street in 1930. I'm gonna tell you some early experience first. I was born over here on East Bank Street. Oh, Dr. Bisco. Some of you remember him. That was Dr. Gorey's daddy that brought me into this world. He's drunk as an Indian when he did. Uh, that's that's probably what happened. Mean. That's what was wrong with me that, all these years. I was a freshman at Henderson when my guard unit was called out for the integration of Central High School. It nearly cost me an education. Dwight Eisenhower was president, and he sent the 101st Airborne down. And um, I was assigned with another guy to, with a Jeep out of the motor pool, and I was to drive from Camp Robinson to Central High School and back. We had full combat gear and guns and everything, but no bullets, kind of like Barney Five, you know. <laughs> there was a show of force, and we, uh, we stayed up there three weeks, and um, it, uh, some of the guys in the other colleges, they wouldn't let Tim make up the thing, but I, I was able to make up my hours at Henderson, thank goodness. After graduating from Henderson, uh, we came to Dumas in 1961. Made in hour to interview with a guy, superintendent from West Memphis, but his car broke down, and Ben Stevens showed up. Ben was superintendent then, and uh, elementary principal. I mean, uh, teachers were premium back then. And he needed Maydean, but he didn't need me. I was, I was a psychology major anyway and didn't plan to teach. I was planning on going into a private practice. But anyway, uh, Ben showed up, and um, so he had to call uh, Lois Howler and ask her if she would take the English and Latin, they were te still teaching Latin then, Latin job, and let me have the social studies to level great American history job, and she, she did. And I taught right between she and Miss Donnie Watts. She, well, she was then wise later on. But anyway, you can imagine, they kept me straight, buddy. Uh, <laughs> they taught me a lot because on the way to Dumas, now mind you, I hadn't pr uh, practice taught, made him uh, practice taught at uh, First Forward. Anyway, but uh, I asked her on the way to uh, uh, Dumas, I said, well, what do I do? She said, call the roll. <laughs> well, after about two days of that, I knew something else had to happen. <laughs> and I really wished that I had, had known then what I knew at the end of my career. I would have been a good teacher. Because at the end of my career, I was teaching teachers some techniques to teach. But then I just thought, I taught just like I'd been taught in college. I'd lecture for 50 minutes and give a pop test in the next day's assignment. You know, that's the way it was. And uh, Joy alluded to this. I, I'll tell you something about what teachers and students wore back then. Kind of like preacher of the choir, maybe. Most, most of them were here were in, that, in school about this. In 1961, teachers could not wear jeans, and women could not wear slacks or pantsuits. <clears throat> Men teachers were, wore casual or dress slacks. I wore a tie all the time. Uh, Harold Tidwell came in 1969, and we totally integrated in 1970, and around 1972, they allowed the women teachers to wear pantsuits, and you talk about a revolution. Every man and woman teacher had every colored double-knit suit that you could imagine. We were cool, boy, I'm not. <laughs> There was a strict dress code when I first came in 1961. Of course, I'm telling you, Ben Stevens was superintendent then. Harold came in 69. But anyway, students had to have their, the boys had to have their hair cut, they had to wear belts, they had to wear socks. It was a strict dress code. Now, Mr. Stevens, I don't know, I guess I'll just look stupid because, you know, people would pick me out to do things. And they'd say, well, he's going to do it. He's so stupid, he ain't got better sense. Well, Mr. Stevens told me, he, said, but, he always called me Buddy Ruff. He said, now, Buddy Ruff, we have a dress code here, and these girls cannot wear a skirt more than three inches above their knee. And that was school board policy. I had a yardstick, and if I saw a girl 
it gave me a good chance to look at the legs anyway. But I, if I saw a girl that had a short skirt, I, she had to kneel, and I'd put that yardstick down. If it's three inches above her knee, she went to the house, buddy. And that's just the way it was. This girl from a very prominent family, uh, I told her, I said, you, you're going to have to go home. You, I made her kneel, and, I, and it was way up here, you know, little mini skirts. Her mother called me and said, Jean said, uh, Mr. Wester, they didn't call you by your first name, even if they knew you well. And I knew all the parents. But anyway, she said, Mr. Wester said, I bought that at the Maru. Now, the Maru was the place. You know. And uh, I said, yes, ma'am. But I said, it's a school board policy. And, and Mr. Ben told me to enforce it. And he, I said, you know, and she said, I understand. She said, I've let it out as much as I can. But she said, I, I, I just won't let her wear it back to school anymore. And I said, well, I appreciate it. But it, I said, you know, it's a school board policy. Uh, teacher salary. Oh, not that. <laughs> when Maiden and I came here, Maiden made 3600 and I made 3000 She had taught uh, at Amity and Arkadelphia, and so she got $300 more than me. We thought we'd die and gone to heaven. Because I drove a school bus for an additional $100 a month, and we had $8,100 a year. Pardon, we had hit the lottery. <laughs> but the, the bad part about it was, before we came here, Henderson offered me a job making $4,500, an expense account, and a car. And made him want to get closer, back closer to her parents. They were from Alabama. And... I thought I was crazy for turning that job down, but it was, we were making a lot more than a school teacher made back then. But I'm not sorry I did. I'm glad I did now. It was a great move, but at the time, I thought I was crazy uh, for doing it. Uh, we lived in Tom Free's apartment over here, and I, I used to have to say Tom because if you said you live in Free apartment, people thought, boy, it's hard <laughs> up over there. <laughs> They weren't free, they had about fifty dollars a month. <laughs> it was a lot of money. And we had a Bel Air Chevrolet, a new one, and I'm telling you, we thought we'd hit the lottery. And some of the teaching techniques now, you already alluded to this too, but of course, like I said, I was a psychology major and I hadn't I hadn't practiced taught. I, I didn't know what to do. And like I said, I had to teach just like I was taught and as a college, like college professors did, you know and some of the worst teachers in the world are in college, trust me. But uh, anyway, uh, see, uh, where am I? okay. All right, discipline, I'll tell you something about discipline. I only took one student to the office my entire time that I taught. I don't know whether they were afraid of me or respected me, but I knew their parents, and if I had a problem, all I had to do was just call them or see them downtown or something, and the problem was at the end. I mean, I just didn't have any problem. And, uh, you know, when I became principal, it was, I had teachers that had more problems in one day than most teachers have in a lifetime. And it, it was strange that uh, the same students were going from this teacher to another teacher, and this teacher had no problems, and this one just constantly had problems. But I was one of those kind that I, I kept them busy. That's probably it. Now, Governor, I know you're talking to the legislature, and I'm here talking to the museum to some important people, and I'll call you back later. Back. Oh, I don't have to talk to Mike about that. I don't know. You're right. Uh, let me see where it was. No doubt. In 1969-70, uh, Bill Gray uh, became principal, and Harold Tidwell made me assistant uh, principal. Uh, I also taught some classes, too. And uh, then we, like we said, we integrated in 1970, and I went to Reed as junior high principal, and I had grades 7 and 8 on the south side of the uh, campus, and, and uh, Shep and uh, Gerald Shepard and uh, Robert Milner had uh, four, five, six on the uh, north side, and I had 850 kids in those two grades at that time. And uh, Mr. Tipper used to call call me, and he'd say, like the book, you know, 
it's all quiet on the western front because it was west to him you know from the white house and incidentally i'm the one that named that the white house because i tell kids take this over there to the white house and i described it because it sat on the corner of the campus over there and it was one of those from the concentration you know, the old floor camp and margaret knows about that she taught one of them i taught uh, in it too did, that yeah, white house for yeah, a media yeah. map uh, but it's all, it's all quiet on the western front, and uh, after a couple of years, I got Duke Wells uh, as assistant principal uh, down there. And I hate to say it, but back in those days, it was nothing. Uh, we had corporal punishment, and I paddled a bunch of kids every day. I didn't even believe in corporal punishment, but you wouldn't believe it. But it changed my whole personality. Uh, it, it was ruled by the whip. And you couldn't show any weakness because if you did, you'd be gone. And uh, it, it took me a long time to get over that because I, I really was, uh, uh, I was tough, uh, to say the least. He wasn't real tough. <laughs> and Michelle and Gina, uh, they, uh, they teach now. And they'll call me and start telling me about, you know, what they're having to go through. And I'll say, been there and done that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I went to read uh, that year, it, nothing uh, worked. I mean, the bells, the commodes, the roof leaked, <laughs> fountains didn't work, the lights were broken. I had plumbers, electricians, carpenters, roofers, dirt and gravel haulers, even farmers and, and the Douglas <coughs> JCs. I had a chapter then, and David Watt was was a big. I think he may have been president of JCs then. But anyway, he was a big instigator in helping. Uh, get that campus ready to go. And like I say, I had 850 kids and I didn't know uh, even all the teachers and very few of the kids. Uh, and that's what we had to go through. But uh, I was at Reed from 1970 to 74, and then we moved to the junior high, uh, to the old high school. And uh, from 1977 to 1981, I was high school principal. And uh, but before I go on, I want to tell you a human interest story. When I was principal, you got to be careful about what you say to teachers and faculty meeting. They take you literally sometimes, and they hear part of it, and they don't hear the other part. I had complaints from the teachers back when I was principal at high school, and they said, too many kids in the hall between periods. And so I went to the faculty meeting, and I told them, I said, now, kids got to go to school, uh, to restroom during uh, break. Don't let them out of your class to go to the restroom. I said, you, but here's the second part. I said, if you've got an emergency, you know, don't deny a kid. You get, we'll have more problems than a little if you deny a kid to have an accident in class. So I said, send them to me and I'll take care of it. Well, this one teacher took me literally and she wouldn't let this boy go. And his name was Alex Joyner. Never will forget him. And he just walked out of class. And he came straight to my office, though. He's smart enough to know that he messed up by defying the teacher coming. He said, Mr. West, I gotta go to the restaurant. I said, well, Alex, what, what's your problem? He said, I have to go a lot. He said, I, he said, I said, even at night at home? Said, oh yeah, he said, two or three times during the night or more, and he said, all day long. So I knew there was a problem, and Ursula Lee Bridwell, some of you remember Ursula Lee, she was the county health nurse, and I called her, I said, Ursula I got this boy, he's got a kidney problem of some kind. I said, I'm gonna, he said, send him to me. She said, send him to me. Make a long story short, she sent him to a specialist in Little Rock. He did have a problem. He, he threw medication and all. He cured him. And I can't tell you how many times Alex Joyner has wanted to kiss me over the years. <laughs> he has told me, I don't know how many times, that, uh, thank me for it. So anyway, I told Mr. Tittle in 1981, I said, I've had it. Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to find another job somewhere else. I said, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, I think Gina was, was 81, when did she graduate? Seven. Yeah. Seven. And, yeah. Anyway, I, and so I, I was. I was going to look for a job someplace else. And he said, no, he said, you're going to be assistant superintendent. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah. And so uh, that year I became assistant superintendent. And, and uh, I had, uh, I was in charge of, for the last 15 years of, my, of of my career was they were really great. I had a great secretary. 
Betty Redford kept me really straight. She, had a, she has a, a tremendous mind. I didn't have one, but she had one. And uh, I could ask her how many tables we bought back and whenever, and she could tell me. You know, she really, really, I, I'm not saying that because she's here, I'm saying it because it's honest. She, she was a super uh, secretary. Now, as assistant superintendent, I was in charge of doing everything that uh, Harold Tibble didn't want to do, and he didn't want to do anything. <laughs> you better tell you this. I was in charge of, of everything from Title I, we was Title I and Title II then, and uh, all of the programs like classroom <laughs> management and PED and the fire and tornado and disaster drills, the North Central Association meetings, you name it, and I did it. Uh, I don't know how well I did, but we got through it. Now I'm gonna have to tell you something, that's, this is honest, and I'm telling you everything, so I'm gonna tell you this too. I was in charge of North Central, and so I knew it pretty good, and uh, Harold Tidwell, uh, you know, you had to have so many kids per teacher. You couldn't go over that. If you went over that, you had to hire another teacher. If you hire another teacher, you've got to have more money. You have classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. It costs you more money. So he would, I would uh, do the data on it, and, and I'd say, you know, we're over here. He had a saying, put the pencil to it. And I would say, in the old Indian terms, white men speak with fork and pencil. And it was a done deal. I would, I would just put it down on paper and we'd go about a business. Now let me tell you, that wasn't all bad. Because that way he could give teachers bonuses and raises, and that included me and Maydean. So, you know, when I was doing this, I, I shouldn't have been doing it. I should have said, no, I'm not going to do that. But it's not done in this day and time. It was done back in the old days. Uh, okay, in closing, I know you're glad to hear that. The school uh, system was good to me and my family. And I have no kicks coming. As Joyce said, uh, we went through integration as smoothly as any system in the country. And believe me, I was on North Central teams all over this state as assistant superintendent. I, I, got, I, I knew what they were doing, and I, I knew how the problems were. <coughs> I'm not saying we didn't have problems, but I'm saying we went through it as smoothly as anyone. And I have no kicks coming for the school system, even the fact that I was overlooked as superintendent. <coughs> I thought it was my time. But you know what? Don and McCann and I worked great together, and we're still friends today. And I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. I'm going to one up. He said, what did you say you made when you started? 3000 When I started, it was $200 a month for nine months. And Fritz and I lived on it because he was starting out in farming. Well, they didn't have printed money back then. Let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you how it's changed, folks. Look up here. You see all this cotton? And in this country, you don't want to see any cotton next year hardly at all. You know? So, and mostly, and we used to never have corn. When I came here in 61, we didn't have any corn. On the reading plenty of corn was next to you. Feed the news. That's the governor again. <laughs> okay. Let me call you back, governor. <laughs> I want to tell you what mean principal he was. He says he was mean. He was not. When my daughter was had been diagnosed with a melanoma, I went into Mary Jo Gucci's office and called the dermatologist and he told me, I went directly into Jean's office and broke out crying, just sobbing, and my daughter Adrian was supposed to go for um, uh, to LSU, that was her senior year, go to LSU and, and take all of those uh, academic, what, what do you call it, those, she was an honor student, honors, yeah, placement test, yeah, advanced placement test. 
He said, Joy, you cannot let her go by herself. She was going by herself until we found that out. And he said, you cannot let her go by herself. You go with her. And I did. He, he was a very good principal and very, uh, very, very <laughs> But he was caring. Yeah, caring. He was a very caring person. And I don't think the kids were too afraid of you anyway. They were. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I talk with these two people. Yeah, I'm going to let you. Basically, you'll get a check. No, I, I, I don't think you could have found two better educators anywhere than these two guys. I'll tell, tell you about David Rain. I'm not going to tell you the student's name, but I was there was a guy breaking in my office when I was over at the old high school as principal, and I never could catch the sucker. I mean, he was, I, I even slept over there, mate. He can tell you, I slept in that office trying to catch him. And one day I was just looking at a locker that had a lock on it that wasn't supposed to be there. You know, we have a student's name for every locker. And anyway, I looked in, and there was a lot of my stuff in that locker. <laughs> so I just watched the locker, and I caught him. David Rainey was the, he is still the only undefeated coach in the, this school's history. And I met the bus out there, and it was Friday night. They were playing in the tournament at Monticello. They were undefeated. This was one of the star players. And here's what David Rainey said to me. I'll never forget this. He said, if you want it, you take it. And I thought, and I'm glad I did this, and I thought, and I said, Coach, I can handle this Monday just like I handled it Friday. And he went over and scored 40, uh, 20 points, and they, they won the tournament, and he went undefeated. And I'm glad I did because I don't believe in punishing the coach or player for one other individual. And I always admired David Rainey for that. Okay, one other change. <laughs> I do want you to know that they in, introduced art when, when I was teaching. That, that was a big plus for our schools when they decided we needed artists, and guess who was elected to do it? Well, let me, let me say this. Um, there have been some wonderful experiences, but I want to give you one right away, because Gene um, uh, Wester talked about integration and how smoothly it went. Let me give you the black perspective. I was teaching at the high school, and Gene and I will talk about the, the, the class I taught that you used to teach that you taught before I taught it. In fact, he was an outstanding teacher. But So uh, the schools are fully integrated, and um, I report and I come to uh, the, uh, the north end of the campus, and, and that's where all the white kids hung out on the steps. So I walked through there and I said, uh, good morning. Not a word. So this is Monday, Tuesday. I came through there and I said, good morning. Not a word. Wednesday, I come back through there and I said, good morning. Not a word. I know you're hoping. I know you're sitting out there now, <laughs> hoping, aren't you? Thursday, I come through there again and I say, good morning. And I'm sorry, I, I wanted to, this to be a good story for you. Not a word. Friday, I come through there. And I put one foot on the steps, and I was about to say, and everybody in chorus said, good morning, Mr. Rainey. Now, so from, uh, so when Gene says it was successful, it was very successful and very smooth. And I think the reason is the attitude of the folks here in Dumas. So I won't, I won't spend a lot of time with that, but because but, I want to fast forward to some things that I want to spend a lot. How much time did you say? I'm timing you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, Gene and Joy one up me on this. Uh, I was a pretty good teacher because uh, Gene was an outstanding teacher. In fact, I taught some of the classes that Gene taught. Uh, after he'd moved on. And, and of course, I love Joy because um, you talk about innovative and, and creative, 
and student-centered, that was her classroom. I know it's hard to believe because we, we talk about uh, being student-centered now. That's how Joy was way back when. I don't think she was ever anything but student-centered. Right, I never wanted to be an administrator. And, and, uh, and you know, the kids loved her class. They, 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 uh, they respected her and her class, and things went quite well. Now, um, since I started giving you the black perspective, I'm going to give you some more of that black perspective. I started work with Jimmy McGee. And, you know, Jim, you're talking about salaries. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy had two pair of slacks that I knew about. Um, Still has? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I had two pair of slacks. And um, Jimmy used to wear his blue ones uh, Monday through Thursday, and he'd wear the gray ones on Friday. And I'd wear my gray ones on Monday to Thursday and wear my blue ones on Friday. Uh, it was, it was, it was uh, I mean, it was, it was really a, a tough time. I think we all had a good time. We enjoyed it. Um, uh, but it was, it was a different time, and all of us were struggling to make it, and nobody was really making a whole lot of money. Uh, it's, it's amazing, though, that uh, as I look back over uh, my career in Dumas, it is very clear to me that things could have turned out differently. Uh, if I had not been in a good school district, in a good school system, with good administration, I could have learned some habits that would not have been in my in my best interest. So, you know, I applaud uh, Jean, and just to show you how old Jean is, <laughs> um, when I was in graduate school, you know, they, they'd invite successful administrators to come and talk to graduate students. Jean was one of those administrators that they brought in to talk to grad students, and, and he came in, you remember that? Came in and shared about his day and everything, and, and, and uh, uh, we were aspiring administrators, and they were picking the creme de la creme, to come in and talk to our, our class. And so uh, I want to say that in terms of kudos. Now, um, when I was told, uh, when I was asked to be on this panel, um, first of all, I was told by Charlotte Stanksnyder. <laughs> and, and, um, and then I was asked by everyone, everyone else. I was told, I was told now, 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 here I am, um, just, just a poor country boy, and I was told, now, I want you to know that last group we had present at the museum, they were outstanding, no matter what you Now, no matter what, what you think you can do, you're not going to top them. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way you're going to be able to top them because they had this quilt and it was absolutely outstanding. And I, I heard the same thing from Tommy a minute ago. Well, what I really want to push is the distance we've come in, in education. I, I really want to push that because um, I, I think uh, of the 46 years. And honestly, I've been telling people I've been in education almost 40 years, and but it's been 46 years, so that's an awful long time. Um, and I, and I've, I will say to you that uh, with all of your wonderful memories, with all of the wonderful memories we have about our school and how it was, and uh, this is, today, the most exciting time I've seen in my 46 years. I'm gonna give you some examples. Now, um, I was looking around last week to try to identify if we could actually bring some of the technology in and, and share it with you. Um, where we've come in terms of education is, uh, remember the old blackboard? Okay, okay. Uh, that blackboard was initially replaced by uh, a whiteboard. And it was a, um, an interactive whiteboard. 
that a number of our teachers actually use in the classroom today. Uh, so if you can picture uh, students being sent to the board to demonstrate what they know and are able to do, now we're talking about inter interactive whiteboards that teachers use and, stud and students also use. And it's not limited to just the classroom. Uh, because there are, are in internet connections that allow teachers to bring materials in and students to interact with those materials. So we're not talking about now instruction being limited to one particular classroom. It's limited to only to the access that you have to technology. And, and I couldn't do this without plugging uh, technology completely because uh, it has, uh, you know, Jean talked about the dress and how uh, women were allowed to wear pants, how that transformed uh, the culture of education. Well, uh, technology and, um, and uh, internet access and, and the global issues that we all deal with today is transforming education. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, what, what it amounts to is uh, teachers have access to information that they've never had access to before, and, um, and students have access to information and resources that they never had access to before. Before, if you were fortunate enough to get Joy Hudson, then you knew you had a good teacher. If you got somebody else, then maybe you didn't get the, uh, all that you needed. If you got Gene Wesser, you knew you had a good teacher. And, uh, but if you got somebody else, maybe not so much. Today, uh, if there's a good teacher in, in New York, and there's a good teacher in Hot Springs, and if we don't have that, re that, that good teacher here teaching that particular course through our network technology, we can access that and bring it forward. Now, um, th there was the time when uh, education was driven by textbooks. Um, remember the, those textbooks that, yes. that, that uh, these textbooks that were new when Joy started? <laughs> okay. Well, well, what it amounts to now is those textbooks have turned into applications. Do you remember? Um, do you remember in college when? Um, uh, let's see now. Uh, Y'all are pretty old. Um, uh, that was a joke. That was a joke. Yeah, 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 but, but <laughs> didn't you have clip notes in college? Way back when, right? Yeah, there were club notes. And you know those were uh, ways that you didn't have to read all of what you were being required to read. You'd find the summary and read that, right? I did the same thing in college. And you read about this 17-year-old kid who um, sold an application for $30 million. You read about that, right? an application that actually uh, does what we got done with CLEP notes. It, it scans the material, it summarizes the material, so you don't have to read all that stuff. Okay, so here's a kid now, here's a kid who because he didn't want to read it, developed an application that does it for him. And because he was he was creative enough to try to figure out a way to do it, um, to take some shortcuts. He ended up with $30 million. Okay, all right, so that gets to, not, not only are we talking about uh, uh, technology transforming education, and I know it's, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it, can be, it can be challenging uh, for all of us, especially somebody who's been in the in the business for 46 years. Because uh, I've seen it go from horse and buggy uh, 
and now we're at jet speed. And as we say to our staff in the schools, it won't slow down. It will not slow down. If anything, it will speed up. And so uh, what you've seen now in this, these wonderful schools and, uh, that we have here in, in Dumas is uh, we're launching new tech, which gets us to um, a one-to-one -one ratio with, uh, with technology. So that now, uh, these books, uh, in essence, go away, and they're replaced by one-to-one -one technology, uh, laptop computers, and uh, and so, uh, and, and I hope at some point in time I can come back, and we can do some uh, video representations of how it looks. So if you were to go into the East classrooms at the high school now, uh, you would see students sitting around computers. If you would go to the New Tech integrated classrooms now, you'd see uh, the sophomores all sitting around computers. Uh, ultimately, we'll have a one-to-one -one ratio of laptop computers to, to every student, and there's a reason why that must happen. The challenges we face in education today with, uh, with uh, all of the needs of all of the kids. Um, we are forced to individualize education and to personalize it in a way that allows kids to move at their own pace, which means that we, we don't end up slowing it down uh, for the kids who are, who are fast runners. Uh, they is personalized for them as well, so they can take it and they can move it as far as uh, they can take it. And the ones who uh, who need uh, additional help, then they have that individualization and they can extend it beyond, uh, beyond the uh, school day. Example, we got six and a half hours and, and generally uh, during the course of the school day. We can extend that learning by virtue of those computers and the networks that, uh, that we're building in terms of our infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, and then allow them to engage uh, with that network outside of school hours. So if they need additional help, they can actually get it. Uh, so we have an opportunity today with all the wonderful memories that we, we have uh, to, uh, to be globally competitive. And you hear these, these words, and, uh, and it becomes sort of rhetoric. Uh, because all of us want our kids to be able to compete across the world. Uh, but in being globally competitive, it means we also have to be prepared to access information from across the world. Um, now, I hope, hope you know that I wouldn't lose this opportunity to pitch New Tech. And you've heard some things about <coughs> New Tech and and let me, let me talk about it. Um, uh, we had uh, basically about 10 megs broadband. You familiar with broadband? Okay. Uh, I remember when, well, there was nothing about, broadband wasn't even in the language. No, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. Okay, so, so what it amounts to is, uh, we've been building a technology infrastructure for our school district. And the first thing we, were, we needed to do is build the infrastructure. I talked about these networks, how we can connect to information across the world. Well, we didn't have the infrastructure in place to actually do that. So, uh, when we launched New Tech, we were doing two things at once. You've heard of flying the plane while you're... I mean, building the plane while you're flying it? Well, uh, ideally, if we had been able to build the technology infrastructure um, first, we would have had all the kinks worked out. Um, but we didn't have an opportunity to get all the kinks worked out, so we, we launched the new tech network at the same time that we were building the infrastructure. So when we did some, Cutovers, 
and before your eyes glaze over, I'll try to find something else funny to talk to you about. <laughs> now, 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 uh, now, just, just, to, just to help you find some, some laughter, if you're sitting where I'm sitting, and I've been talking about this technology piece, and I'm watching your faces, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, that it, all that it amounts to is uh, when, when, when we were teaching years ago, our goal was to prepare kids for a future. And our mission today is the very same goal. We want to prepare kids for their future. The difference is because school systems always mirror society. They, they're just kind of a smaller component of society. So today, schools reflect where we are in terms of our society. Where we were years ago, our schools reflected what the society uh, represented. Today, our schools reflect that same society. Uh, because we, if you look at it from an economic perspective, um, remember we had some plants that left here and went other places? Yeah. Okay. In search of cheaper wages? Okay. All right. So now in our world, um, we, we can't compete for lower wage jobs. We simply cannot. Um, because Gene talked about uh, having an apartment that was $50 a month. See? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, so long story short, uh, we have economies in the world that, uh, that have people who have technical skills, and they offer those skills because there's so many of them at a reduced wage. So. If we're going to compete here, we have to prepare our kids for highly technical jobs where there's not quite as much competition. In order to do that, then what we've had to do is revolutionize our curriculum. That has changed over time. And then we've had to, from a pedagogical perspective, how we teach, we've had to change that because now, keeping in mind the same goal, we are preparing kids for their future. Now they have to have collaborative skills. Uh, they have to have those critical thinking skills. They have to have some creative thinking skills. They have to be able to, to do that problem solving uh, and collaborate with other people. Some people from across the, across the, the county, some people from across the state, and guess what, folks? Some people from across the world. I can tell you that um, when I say this is the most exciting time in education that I've seen in 46 years, I was going to say 40, in 46 years, it is. It is that way because of the possibilities, what we can do with it, what we can access, and uh, and I'll go back uh, because uh, I've enjoyed a wonderful um, uh, uh, work experience in Dumas. It's one of the reasons I'm back. Um, and when you hear about what we're uh, doing with uh, New Tech, and there will be some missteps along the way, just know that we're doing it because we know that we've got to prepare our kids and, and we realize that this is what this community uh, requires. You want them to be ready. Uh, all of you may not know all the steps that we have to take to get them ready, um, but just believe that we'll be doing that. Now, uh, Charlotte, 
I, I'm sorry that I didn't do something that was really, really funny. I was trying really hard, but I don't tell jokes really well. Gene uh, helped me on some of them, and, and, and then... Um, uh, and My name's Joy. You're right. <laughs> but I didn't even know Joy um, could tell good jokes. <laughs> um, so... Again, it's it's a it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'll stop now. And uh, <laughs> now, do you, don't you don't you know why we he's our superintendent? Gosh, he 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 can play on the for this for us. It's great. You want a question? As a parent, who spent all his time with his children, went through the Duma school system, and all of y'all here know that our kids went to the best schools they could go to, y'all's did, and they all did so well. They had the background here, and it served them well. Thank and you. And that's the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> and y'all, uh, Joy mentioned uh, Mr. Gill. That's his picture back there. Marion had me to send the picture off and have that done of him uh, put over here. That's the uh, he was an institution. Well, when I was a child, I came up and tell her all I ever heard about was D.W. Gill at Dumas. <laughs> when I first came here, Sammy Gill was coaching. Uh, you know, he coached at McGee for many years, and Sammy Gill said he had moved more coal than a West Virginia coal miner. You know, they had an old coal bin over there, and, when, and Sammy stayed in trouble. And Mr. Gill, I can vouch for that. He would move the coal pile. And if he trouble, he'd move it back. And he spent his time moving. He said he'd move more coal in the West Virginia miner. He's also up there in the class of 1926 as a superintendent. He was, my mother's in the 26th class, and he was superintendent then. When I was in high school, if our kids acted up in McGee or Dermot or he knew it. They didn't call the police. Uh -huh. They called Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. <laughs> he actually, yeah, he would actually, if he comes and smoke as a student, smoking mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday downtown, he'd whip you on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. Even when you were here. I did enjoy this one of your art students here. He's the one that designed the uh, plaque uh, seal on the door of the Sheridan Hall that we have here. Oh, yeah. 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 And we had a contest. I was the one that started that, and and, uh, and he won it. And, and I, that's one of your people you are, too. She's a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. Listen, we had a great faculty. Everybody asked, after I retired, would say, do you really miss it? Do you miss it? I, I said, I miss the kids. I really do. But I think I miss the camaraderie we had, the faculty mm -hmm. had. We just we just had a, always had a big faculty, yes. superb faculty. And that was for that. And I still miss it. And Dr. you know, it was a great interest that you mentioned the new tech and what is going to be qualified now demanded of the student because so many college students now do not go to class. They do their hours on uh, the computer. A lot of them. And uh, the, it goes right on to what you were talking about, alluded to. There's so many people now that don't, don't go in their office but one day a week out in the professional field. They work at home because of computers. Traders, a lot of people. And we, I know a number of them, and uh, that's where it's going now. And I asked Rankin one day, I said, Rankin, when was the first time you were ever exposed to computers? He said, in the second grade here. And uh, he takes courses now on computers at Ole Miss, just like all of the students at Arkansas and PCU and everywhere else do take classes like that because the professors now have graduate assistants that teach their classes so they can go into research, that's where the money is, and they can't understand a number of the graduate assistants that teach. Frank has got one now at Ole Miss that said, I can't understand what he's taking what he's saying. So, uh, there's 400 people in class and he said, I'm not going to ask a question. And you can't take tape recorders in there that they know of and tape the lecture, you know, to, to 
to get the boats moving the, the direction you talk, it's, it's going that way and fast too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Dwight is, uh, he, he, he knows this, but I have two sons-in-law who are college level coaches and when Bradley was at LSU, he took me into the room and showed me the electronic uh, gadgets that they have just getting ready for a, a team, the next uh, team. If they want to know what they run on the 40 at a certain time, they can get it instantly just like that and they have these screens and they're position coaches for so, you know, 10, 15 kids and they're all in there and they got all these screens and they got all the electronic uh, devices, these apps that, that they can uh, show a kid what they will probably want run or maybe what they should be running. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, and if you think the coach is just a dumb coach in this day and time, uh -uh. it has really changed. And it goes back to the filming people, you know, because yeah. they're experts and what we're talking about and everything's on computers now that you're talking, but there's a way, you know, now the computers are such an extent if they wanted to, they could show you the first half tapes at the half, but you see no way. Uh, one of the most memorable experiences is that I had, uh, while attending school at Wolf Project, and of course that's uh, about four miles from McGee, and, and um, Richard Smith uh, was uh, my social studies teacher. And, uh, and periodically he'd make trips to New York and see some plays, and, and uh, it was a novelty for us to have a teacher who actually traveled outside of Arkansas and could, uh, but he shared with us, um, Evidently, this was a play that was important at that time. Um, so he borrowed a phrase from that uh, that play, and there was uh, a, an, 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 a reference to "Stop, world! You're moving too fast. Uh, I want to get off." And he said to us at that point in time that um, in the future we would be, uh, this thing would be moving so fast until we would want to say, stop world, uh, you're moving too fast, I want to get off. But, uh, now, I don't know if that's, but that's one of the stories that, that actually um, um, was, is memorable to me, but important to me because uh, those are, these are the times we're living in today. Um, uh, I want to reference what I'm passing around there. Um, that's an application called Solar Walk, and um, uh, what it amounts to is when we studied the solar system years ago, um, uh, there was no interaction, uh, and there's a, a little music playing, but uh, what it amounts to is you can pull up all of the planets. Uh, you can actually see the rotation of the sun and uh, of the, of the uh, rotation of the planets around the sun. Uh, it simulates uh, how they're positioned together, the distance from the sun, and what happens as a result of it. So um, that's just one example of the distance we've come in education. And one last thing about... Um, uh, we used that to make the models with the ball. Yes, yes. Uh, today, we're looking at how far down in elementary school we can move keyboarding. Because guess what? Yeah, remember when, when uh, it was offered in high school? Now we've got to offer it in elementary school so that kids will have that skill going forward. Uh, we haven't made that move, but that's one of the places we're going to go. Miss Charlotte, Honorable Miss Charlotte, is there another story that you, you you wanted to remind me of about what project? I don't know all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a question. How do we not teach cursive writing anymore? Oh, that's wonderful. Cursive writing. Cursive writing. My kids, my grandkids print everything, and that's slow. But they use it. Thank you.
Yes. Um, cursive writing is used now as uh, a way to say to people that you're sending something to. I took the special time and effort to do it, and it becomes uh, important because you did do that. Uh, but beyond that, there's not a lot of need for it. And um, so, I knew you would have an answer. Yeah, so <laughs> what we're doing is uh, we're trying to uh, adopt a philosophy from grades pre-K through three. Kids are learning to read, and from that point on, they are reading to learn. So it becomes very, very critical that we attend to those reading skills at that early point in their life because they can educate themselves if they can read and comprehend well, the information is there available to them. And I appreciate you mentioning the online work because uh, now you're familiar with AP, but there's concurrent credit. And all of these are ways that give, give uh, students, thank you, uh, give students that access that we've been talking about. So um, this idea of DTEC, is a critical infrastructure piece in this community. And, and I wish everybody understood how important it is as we are building that infrastructure. Because now, we're talking about college classes that have an opportunity uh, that, are, that are housed there. So the education level of our community can grow based on that resource. I know this is not a... a campaign for, for DTEC, but it is, a, it is a resource that this community sorely needs, and as we're building that, as we're building that, um, we're also building greater opportunity for all of our folks. And, um, oh, punch it, punch it. I honestly wanted to bring some technology that you could actually see and feel and touch, and that was as much as we could accommodate here. But, but I really, really would like for you to have an opportunity to see it in operation and in action. Making me think of double A. The students actually have access. Do they? What do they have in the classroom now? Do they have iPads? And uh, the, laptops. I read somewhere some classes are required to bring laptops. Everybody has uh, Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, the sophomores had laptops this year. Next year, juniors and sophomores will have laptops. And then in year three, uh, the, the entire high school will have those, those laptops. And, uh, and it's not something that uh, we take lightly in terms of of its use. Those laptops or um, a textbook on steroids, in essence. So that's what it is. It's information, it's research uh, capability, it's all that they need to enrich and enhance their education. It is not a toy. It is not a luxury. It is an absolute necessity. And the quicker we can get it in our hands, the better we, we are uh, serving their needs. And I can't emphasize that enough. Go ahead. As the old saying goes, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, let me tell you one quick story, and I, and I won't shut up. I won't tell you more. <laughs> this actually happened. This is one of these human interest things. When I was teaching, well, I counted my test. And Peggy's already, done, she knows what I'm big to. And I, I, one day I miscounted. I didn't think I'd miscounted, but I thought someone had stolen one. And boy, I was fixing to lay the hammer on them. Well, I told them, I said, y'all, just go and take the test, leave your books on your desk, and I'll, uh, I'm going to look, look at your books. Because I knew I was going to find where my test was. Nancy Carter Jacuzzi, she was Nancy Carter here, and they wore those felt skirts back in those days, you know, had 900 petticoats underneath them, you know, the poodle skirts. 
Well, she sat the second seat over here by the window, that old junior high wing. And so I'm going to, and I'm going to check the books. And what, what I intended to say was, when I got to Nancy, was move your skirt where I can get your books and look through them to see if there's anything. And what I said was, Nancy, raise your skirt and let me see what's under there. <laughs> Standing there, and George Cahey fell out of his seat. <laughs> and Nancy, of course, as yes, y'all knew her, she was well, Mr. Wesser. <laughs> I could have killed her. Anyway, I stood there, and they laughed for 15 solid minutes, and I couldn't do anything about it. The little boys came up and they said, Mr. Wesser, you missed County. He said, If that sucker was out, I'd have had it. And then they were right out.